Today, productivity has become an individual pursuit. Rahaf Harfouche. She's a Canadian you may never have heard of before, but you may be able to relate to the message she's spreading. We work too damn hard. And in the 21st century, the way our very jobs are changing, from the factory floor to the knowledge economy to who knows, we're on a fast track to trouble. Consider this, Harfouche first made a name for herself a decade ago, volunteering on Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. That experience drove her first book, and since then, she's become a New York Times best-selling author, traveling the world, studying and speaking about the impact of technology on people, on culture, and increasingly, on how we define work and how work defines us. But fast forward to 2016, her life came to a crashing halt. She was paralyzed by burnout. And as a self-described creative who could no longer create, she had to ask herself the question, now what? Her soul searching led to her latest book, Hustle and Float. And I sat down with Rahaf Harfouch recently in Toronto. Rahaf, very nice to have this chance to chat with you. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> so, so what was it then? I mean, you talk about kind of hitting that, that breaking point. In the moment, I mean, as you were overworking, D did you know, did you realize it was, it was unhealthy, that it was having a harmful impact on you? For a large part of my working life, it was very much focused around this idea that I had to do more and more and more and more in order to reach this success. And for me, what ended up happening was I ended up overworking and then having and suffering from severe health setbacks, uh, burnout, you know, insomnia, uh, not being able to eat, not being able to sleep, losing my hair. And I and once you hit that physical wall, you're like, OK, well, clearly this strategy of I'm going to outwork everyone else by doing it harder and longer, that's not getting me closer to where I want to go. And more than that, it's risking everything that's important to me, which is not only my mental and emotional and physical well-being, but my ability to generate ideas that I need to do to keep paying my rent and to keep being able to work. So part of arriving at the point that I think you've arrived at, I think is, is summed up in the title of the book, which is Hustle and Float. Mm -hmm. Can you first explain what that means? So hustle and float is a term that I heard um, from a family friend who is a river guide. It's a whitewater rafting term, and it's used to describe the perfect trip. So the perfect whitewater rafting trip has two parts. There's the part where you hustle, where there's rapids, and you have to paddle as hard as you can to navigate and to make, you know, avoid obstacles and to get to where you want to go. But then there's an equally important part of the trip where you lift your paddles out of the water and you let the river do the work, and the river carries you. And if you have too much hustle, you'll get exhausted, you'll make mistakes, which is quite dangerous. If you have too much float, it's boring, and then you don't really have any control in where you go and where you end up. And I think for creative professionals, that is the perfect way to describe how we need to work and how we can be creative. Right, and, and, and so that's perhaps my next question. Who particularly should be hustling and, and floating? I mean, I think all of us. In the book, I've used the word productive creative as a term because I think that the majority of people today that work in knowledge economies, whether you're an accountant or, or a lawyer or a banker or a teacher or a journalist or a writer or a strategist, we're all being paid to be creative at work. Now that is, that's something that it's a skill set that we are being financially compensated for. So that means that we need to start looking at how to design systems that enable us to do the best quality level of work, knowing that historically all of the systems that we are forced into actually come from industrial revolution era type thinking, meaning it was designed for a type of work that we don't do anymore. So, But explain that for me. I mean, the, the, the tension between being creative and being productive. What's, what's interesting is that when you look at how uh, management thinking developed over time, it's, it, it came really on the floor of factories, and it came around this idea of productivity as linked to continuous output. You went onto the assembly line, you did X amount of widgets in your eight-hour shift, and every single day at the end of the day, you had the same amount of product that you were responsible for producing. And that's how it was for a long time. With knowledge work, 
we don't produce widgets, we don't produce cars on assembly line. I can't say to you, how many ideas are, are you going to get done? How many ideas are you going to produce in an eight hour day? It just doesn't work like that. But those were the best systems that we had to manage people. So we kind of took these complex creative tasks, we shoved them into systems that were designed for a completely different type of work. So suddenly, you have this expectation where you have to be productive, productive being continuous output, productive being you have to justify every minute of your working day. You're in a call, you're in a meeting, you're doing the work. And anything that wasn't considered under the umbrella of productivity was frowned upon. If you are taking a coffee break, if you're out for a walk, if your manager doesn't see you sitting at your desk from that nine to five, it's considered a waste of time. But what we now know about how the brain works, we need those breaks and that needs to be considered a part of the process and not a diversion from the end goal. So working hard isn't necessarily working smart, but how does that square with some of the biggest success stories of our time? Steve Jobs, a 14-hour workday, just a normal day. Elon Musk, making his bed literally on the factory floor. Bill Gates, Oprah, all icons of a superhuman work ethic. And the number one lesson I could offer you where your work is concerned is this. Become so skilled, so vigilant, so flat out fantastic at what you do that your talent cannot be dismissed. Regardless of how they get it done, I think most people, the science shows, is that burnout is a real thing and that these models of sustained overwork over a long period of time will catch up with you. There will be people who have heart attacks. You will have depression and anxiety. You will suffer the consequences if you burn out. Burnout is a real physical thing. So I think that it's it's very misleading to look at these people and say that, oh, well, like, overwork works, they had it done, because I often think the media only shows us one part of the picture. I mean, I go back to the example in the book of Beyonce, where you look at Beyonce and, and you look, look at everything that she's accomplished, wealth, fame, power, right? But she herself was so burnt out in 2011 that she had to take an entire year off. And I think many times we talk about the light part, like the very exciting part. We don't talk about the shadows because when you look at the percentage of articles that were written about her, there was like so many that were written about her work ethic, so many that were written about how hard she works, how long she works. Very few that were written about the fact that she had to take an entire year off to physically and mentally recover. But I feel like there, there must be a whole subset of people who kind of wear that as a, as a badge of honor too, right? They, they derive a sense of, of pride from the fact that they're working so hard. And this is what's the really fascinating thing is that culturally the rituals that we've developed around how we talk about work and around how we link our importance to how hard we work, not even just the job that we do, that's not even important enough anymore. It's like not just the job that we do but how hard and how we work at it. Mm -hmm. That goes counter to all of the actual things we need to do to be healthy and to be more creatively prosperous. Like when you say that, I'm thinking, you know, when you go to a party, what's the first question you ask someone? Right? What do you do? What do you do? Uh, and, and so is that, I mean, so to what extent then are, are, have our identities become so, so intertwined with, with work? I mean, you are what you do. I mean, is that kind of what you're getting at here? Most people are working for the majority of their day. So of course that's gonna be the thing that you fall back on when you consider your identity and who you are, because many people at the end of a long day don't have the energy or the time to be able to develop all of these other different parts of their identity because they're tired, because they're working 80 hour work weeks. So to someone like Oprah who says, work hard, and success will come, you would say. And my problem with saying work hard and you'll be successful is that when you flip it, what you're really telling people, if you're not successful, then you must not be working hard enough. And I think that's a very sad message, a very dangerous message, because a lot of people, there are people in this country that will work three part-time jobs just to make ends meet. Are they not working hard enough? There are people who will, you know, who on top of working a full-time job have uh, aging parents to, to take care of, have um, you know, family obligations, have kids to raise, have all these other things that they have to do. Are they, should they be working harder at their jobs and ignoring all these other responsibilities? To me, this is just a fundamental need to redefine what success is going to look like in a way that's a bit more sustainable, a, a bit more compassionate. Because many of these people that you, you know, that we talk about are people who have the, the benefit of having a lot of support systems in place, of having the money to be able to maybe hire extra staff, hire nannies, hire cooks, travel by jet, all of these things that enable them to get 
more things done, I think the average person can't look at that as a standard and then feel guilty and shame themselves because they're just struggling to make ends meet because salaries haven't risen, because there's like wage stagnation, because of all these other economic factors. Instead, we say, no, 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 none of that's a big thing. You should really be working harder. I saw something on Instagram the other day that said, if you're not going where you want to be in your life, have you considered what you're doing between 7 p.m. and 12 a.m.? This is the narrative that I want to fight against. Not working hard, not dreaming big, not sacrificing some things to build important things, but about this idea of what success looks like and what is required for us to, to, to get there, I think there's definitely room for improvement. I think that's a good point to, to wrap the interview. Rahaf, really nice to talk to you. Thank Thanks you so much. So much.